I'm so happy to be here. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. If not, I'm sure I'll get some panic messages. Um, this is such an absolute honor for me. First off, to be able to be part of Classroom 2.0 is always an honor. But to introduce Nikki, I have to give a little tiny bit of background and then I'll, expl I'll talk to you about Nikki. I was fortunate enough to be chosen to be a certified um, brain pop educator when I say chosen, took classes, did a bunch of stuff, and I got to meet her in New York last year. What a breath of fresh air. She is remarkable. And by chance, I discovered her presentation at ISTE last year, went into it. It was packed. She did a remarkable job and several of us asked if we could have um, access to her presentation and she said, well, it's got my student pictures in it. I'm not really comfortable with that. And I have to tell you, within a week, she sent it out to all of us who had made that request. She got things worked out so we could use it and I was able to share it with um, uh, numerous kindergarten teachers in our district. So she had her effect. So obviously, she's an amazing person. But um, let me go back and give a little bit of background about her. She taught kindergarten for or K-1-2 classroom for about 12 years. And this year, she's moved to a 4-5 combo. She teaches in a very small school in, um, out of Bozeman, Montana. And I've seen pictures. It is truly an amazing place up there. And she's a nationally board certified teacher. She is a brain pop certified teacher. She is a 2014 PBS Digital Innovator. She was finalist, and I followed her on this one for the 2017 Montana Teacher of the Year. I'm just tired talking about it. She blogs with her students. Um, she presents at ISTE at NCCE in Seattle. And on top of that, she has small children. She owns pets. She's a reader and a writer and a camper. Again, I'm just exhausted talking about all that she does. Guys, sit down, get comfortable, because she is going to share so much incredible information from this truly incredible lady. Nikki, I think you can take it away now. All right. Thank you, Kim. That, that was such a nice introduction. I got goosebumps. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me on Classroom 2.0 Live. This is so exciting. I just love what you're doing with giving teachers access to self-selected professional development. And um, I'm, I'm just honored to be here today. So thank you so much. Um, so I believe I'm supposed to answer this question here. Um, what does Web 2.0 mean to you? And why do you use 2.0 tools in your classroom? Um, so for me, 2.0 means the upgraded version or the, the latest and the greatest. So using the latest and the greatest tools in my classroom um, is, of course, what we all want to do um, because no one wants to be stuck using something old if they don't have to. Um, but for me, using the 2.0 tools and doing everything with a 2.0 means that we are using tools that are engaging and especially not just for the students but also for the teachers. And one of the big drives for me using technology with kids is obviously for the kids, but it sure does make things a lot of fun for me. And that is one of the reasons that I'm really excited to be here today to share with you some of the practices I've had in my classroom for the last mm -hmm. few years and how I've integrated technology into most of the subjects that I teach. So the title of my sessions in the past has been Kinder Tech because I was teaching, as Kim said, a K-1 class for the last 12 years. And so um, I primarily have gone around sharing with teachers about how I've used technology with little people. And this summer, I was given the opportunity to move up into the grade levels and teach the 4-5 combo. And because I love the idea of change and shaking it up a bit, I said yes. And I am now. Um, be a super newly energized teacher of the fourth and fifth grade classroom in my school. And so I just pushed everything across the hall. And now I am giving an LM Ed Tech presentation because I can now share with you how I'm using a variety of tools for the fourth and fifth grade as well as how I use them for the K-1. So here I am. Uh, this is a slide about all the things that I am passionate about. Um, the first one is I, I do like to chug coffee, and I do look just like that Bitmoji, in case you're wondering. They're always so flattering. <laughs> but I come from Bozeman, Montana. They're back there in southwestern Montana. Um, we are just a, 
about an hour or so away from the entrance to Yellowstone Park. And we are home to three major ski resorts. And currently now we are, I'm looking out at a nice dusted snow in our front yard. Um, winter is here. I've been fortunate enough to be involved with some amazing tech companies, um, BrainPop being the, my first and favorite. Uh, I think that a lot of the tools that I use throughout the day are BrainPop tools, and um, I'll get to share with you just all the different ways that I use them. Um, I've also done a lot of work with PBS and was fortunate enough to be one of their um, PBS Digital Innovators. And I just recently became an alpha squirrel working for the squirrels company. They have a, a great app called Reflector that I use to mirror um, my iPad to my computer screen and um, project things for my students. And they've invited me to be a part of their educators group. Um, you can find me on Twitter where I am an active Twitter user. And I just started co-moderating our chat here in Montana called Montana Ed Chat. And please join us on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. I'll be moderating this week's chat, and we're going to, going to be talking about the hour of code. And so hopefully you'll, you'll join us for that. This is where I work. Um, this is Lamont School. We are a rural K-8 school. We have 70 students. And um, this view is just one of the many perks <laughs> to working at Lamont. Um, however, it does not look like this now. You need to imagine it shrouded in winter um, because we are covered in snow and we usually get more snow out there than the rest of the valley does. It's in a place called Bear Canyon. Right now, if you look at that blacktop down there, what it looks like now is they are currently constructing an ice skating rink in that area. Um, it was something we did last year and we're building on it this year and it's a, a wonderful opportunity for the kids to use the fact that we don't have a gym <laughs> in our school. Um, we we kind of create those opportunities using our setting. So I'm very passionate, as I said, about using technology to integrate things in my classroom. This is just a little peek into my K-1 classroom last year. Most of these slides are going to show my, my K-1 kiddos. I don't have a lot of my fourth graders in here. However, my current four or five kids were in my class as K-1, so I do have some slides of them working when they were younger. Um, I always talk to teachers about the power of using tech tools with their students because um, we can get so many powerful things from them. Wonder, engagement, collaboration, imagination, curiosity. Um, the, when I taught K-1, we were one-to-one -one with iPads. Uh, we started with just one iPad in the room that I got through a grant um, from our local TV station. And uh, all of the things mm -hmm. I'll be doing, sharing with you today, we did um, with just one iPad for a couple of years. And that helped me to build the momentum to eventually write a few more grants. We used Donors Choose to add five more iPads to our collection. And then um, my principal is just a, a budgeting wizard and was able to add a, a set of 20 to my room a couple years ago. And so everything that we did just grew in volume um, after we became one-to-one. -one. Now that I'm in fourth and fifth, we have Chromebooks one-to-one. -one, and this is the first year that my whole school has deployed a one-to-one -one environment. It's much easier to do that when you have 70 students, because you only have 70 devices to purchase. But it is something that we did gradually over time. As you can see, I'm a big um, supporter of flexible learning spaces. So we have beanbag chairs and large pillows and small uh, cushions for kneeling on. In this room, I had lowered all of the tables so that they could kneel at them. And I got rid of all of the traditional chairs. Um, in my current four or five room, we have a couch. We have a table that is lowered so they could kneel at it if they needed to. We have wobble stools. We have bean bags. We have pillows. We have Crazy Creek chairs. Um, we have about six traditional blue chairs, which no one sits on. Um, they're there um, in case, <laughs> in case we have a guest in the room and they want to sit on it. Um, so, as I said, tech fits easily into this room. I should also mention the the Promethean board you see there. Most of what I do involves a projector and a Promethean board, and that has been uh, pinnacle for me in everything that I do. Um, I always say the one thing I couldn't live without would be my Promethean board. Um, I feel like I could do everything else I do <laughs> as long as they didn't take that away. 
So the first strategy I want to share with you is I like to start my day with wonder. And I use a wonderful tool called Wonderopolis to do this. This is a strategy I used in K1 and I currently use with the four or five and we call it the wonder of the day. And we begin our day, the students walk in and they have a spiral notebook laid out on the table with their names on it. And projected on the screen is an image from Wonderopolis. With the K1s, it was just the image with no text. Um, with the four or five, it's the main page of Wonderopolis with both the image and the question of the day or the wonder of the day. Yesterday, our wonder was, how fast can a sneeze travel? Um, and in case you're wondering, it's 93 miles per hour, covering a distance of up to 200 feet. Um, the kids come in, they find their places, they open their notebooks, and they can respond to the image in whatever way works for them. With the K1s, it was primarily pictures. With the four or fives, they, they, act, they, they do a little bit more writing, maybe a little bit of sketching. Um, after I've done the attendance and checked in with everybody and done all that, that beginning, of day, beginning of the day housekeeping stuff, I, I gather them in our meeting area. I um, in K1, it was that rug you see in the background. In 4 or 5, it's just the place that we've called the meeting area. And they roll the yoga balls over and the crazy creeks. And we have a seat and I ask them to do some turn and talk with a partner, someone who is not at the table. Because obviously, there was some discussion at the tables while they were working. And I always say that I invite that discussion. Um, my room is never silent, um, unless the kids are just not in the room. Um, I, I want them to talk. I want them to share. And this, this Wonderopolis page gives them something something important or authentic to talk about. Once they've had a chance to turn and talk with their neighbors, then we come together and we have a little group discussion. We go through the page on Wonderopolis and I read that text to them. Wonderopolis does a great uh, job of writing a nice kid-friendly nonfiction piece of text. Um, that this is a great way for the kids to hear the, the flow and the sound of nonfiction text on a regular basis. Uh, we wa look at the other images and discuss them. Uh, we watch the, this short little video that's always there that's just a few minutes. And it is just a way to begin our day. Sometimes I choose a topic that relates to what we're discussing in science or social studies or reading. Or sometimes I just see what their wonder is and that's what we talk about. It's been a great way for me to access the prior knowledge of my students on a daily basis. Earlier this week, it was all about the bubonic plague, and I was blown away at how much my class knew about the bubonic plague um, and how fascinated they were. And so that day, the wonder took quite a bit longer than it normally does. Um, it can go as short as I need it to or as long as I need it to, and that's what's beautiful about it. Um, this is a, a slide of what a wonder journal might look like. This is a, a first grader. And she has just drawn and labeled and responded to an image about the planets. And that's what her notebook looks like. When they fill up their wonder journals, we just send them home and give them a new one. Um, kids usually go through about two throughout the year. Uh, at least the K-1 kiddos did. So the other thing I'm incredibly passionate about is blogging. I started blogging with kids about five years ago. Um, and what got me excited about blogging was the Common Core State Standards, for which I'm a huge supporter of. Um, they are alive and well in my classroom. And uh, when I first read them, I saw the line about publishing writing using digital tools. And that was there as low as kindergarten in first grade. And I, I, I have to say, it, I was like, oh, I, how do I do this? Um, and a good friend of mine uh, who is a tech specialist here in Montana, Lindy Hockenberry, showed me blogging and introduced this idea of, of using blogging to let the kids publish their writing. And so that's what exactly what it became. In K-1, we used iPads. And when they finished um, writing a piece, they would take a picture of it with the iPad. And they would post that picture to our blog. It was as simple as that. Um, and then I began to use some other tools, screencasting tools, such as Explain Everything, to have them take a picture of their writing and then record themselves reading their writing and then post that to EasyBlog. And then this just became this, this powerful way of recording student progress uh, that didn't leave a paper trail. And it was so amazing to see, to scroll through their posts and see the growth. And then what became even more amazing was that it 
we created this community of uh, other teachers and parents and other students who were looking at their of their sorry at their blog posts, making comments and giving them feedback. So suddenly they were writing for an authentic audience. And I had grandparents you know, on the East Coast who were tearing up <laughs> at the idea that they were able to suddenly be connected with their grandchildren from across the country. I had a grandpa who lived just up the road from the school who checked out the blog every single day and made comments on every student's blog post. Um, and it was such an amazing thing for my students to see how their writing could affect people outside of our room. And so the tool I began using, I've tried a couple, but I've landed on EasyBlog for a few reasons. The EasyBlog company um, named their, their tool very well. <laughs> it's very easy to use. And within the EasyBlog app, there's an audio recording tool, which means my kids could post pictures of their work and then hit the record button and talk over their pictures. This is really powerful in the primary classroom because writing is, is, is emergent, but talking is not. Um, they can talk and talk and talk about what they're doing, and hearing their little voices on an audio recording is something that is so special. Um, so I also stuck with EasyBlog because they also had a tool where the kids could play their, record, their comments back to them. When I'd use other tools, um, they would have to have me read their comments to them. And that was, that, that was kind of a sticking point. With EasyBlog, there is an audio icon next to each comment someone makes on their posts that they can hit. And then the Siri reads in kind of the robot voice, which always makes them laugh, um, about what, what the comment was. And that's really exciting. You'll see the, the links there. I've got my K1 blog from last year. And then I've got my current fourth and fifth grade blog. And I think it's interesting to see the difference in the, the types of posts that we're doing. Now, my fourth and fifth graders are using EasyBlog on Chromebooks. And so the, it works a little bit differently than it did on the iPads. It doesn't have that audio record function. Um, and I'm hoping, my fingers are crossed, that they'll be adding that soon to their web version. The other reason I've stuck with EasyBlog is the company itself has been incredible to work with. They've been really quick about responding to questions. Um, they're a, a little company, just got their start a couple years ago. Um, and the main te the people who created EasyBlog are teachers. And they are working at a school in Berlin, I believe. Um, and so they were at ISTE last year, and I got to meet them in person. And they've been so supportive of me and everything that I've done that I just tried to share. I've stuck with EasyBlog for that reason. Seesaw is another great tool that I highly recommend um, that does many of the same things that EasyBlog does. Um, the only reason I don't use Seesaw is because I found EasyBlog first, and they've been so great to work with. I really haven't had a reason to switch. Um, but I definitely think that Seesaw is another great tool. I want to show you a couple samples of what it might look like in case you're unable to get to the blog itself. I'm still working on the privacy settings for our four or five blogs, so I see some of you are having a hard time getting there. Um, I'll see if I can work on that. This is what the main page looks like when a student comes to the site and they would touch their name or the parent would touch their name and then they would be able to see their student's work. This is an example of a kindergarten piece of work. Um, after art class, we have uh, separate art teachers. But I would have um, the students take a quick photo of the, the work they created with the art teachers and either audio record themselves describing their work or the student toward the end of the year last year as a kindergartner um, typed in some words um, to go with her work. And this was, this one's near and dear to my heart. I, I have to say that this is my daughter. <laughs> so I have a lot of her work up here. And she was in my class last year, which was really special for both of us. Um, so this is a, a kindergarten piece. This is a, a first grade response to a video she was watching on my favorite site, Brain Pop. Um, she took a screenshot from the Brain Pop video she was watching and then imported that screenshot into EasyBlog. 
and then typed up a little summary of what she learned from watching that video. Um, I love screenshots and I use those a lot and they're so easy with iPads and even with Chromebooks to have a kid respond to what's on the screen is, is a really cool way to see what they're thinking. Um, BrainPop has a tool embedded into their site called the SnapThought tool where kids can take screenshots of their gameplay and then type um, a similar message to this about what they were learning and I took that really fueled my use of screenshots with blogging. Um, so this is a first grader summarizing what she learned about George Washington from watching a video. And here's a fourth grader um, responding to a book we had read. We participated in the Global Read Aloud this year and the featured author illustrator for the picture books was Lauren Castillo. And so we read the picture books and the kids just searched for an image of the book and imported it to their easy blog and then responded to what the book was about. You can see the difference in typing here <laughs> between a, a fourth grader and a kindergartner and a first grader. Um, you can also see where fourth graders are savvy and that they can choose the colors for their text and using font more closely. Blogging has been great for helping kids with editing and, and fixing their writing. It's also been a motivator for both spelling and handwriting because if you create work on a page and you go to transfer it to the blog and you can't read it, that's your first signal that you've um, got to go back and do some fixing before you can get it up there. Um, it's also, EasyBlog has a spell check tool within it and so they can see when they've misspelled a word. And in my class, we use OK Google to fix words. So you'll hear a lot of, OK Google, how do you spell cooperate? And then, oh, it's got two O's. And then they click back and fix that, which I think is a really powerful experience for kids that it's not so much how to spell a word, but it's recognizing when the word is wrong and then figuring out how to fix it. Here's a fifth grade blog post from earlier this week. The kids were working in research teams to research an explorer and then they summarized their work on a poster. Um, I still do pencil paper tasks. Um, I still read real books. <laughs> we still use markers. Um, tech hasn't replaced any of that. It's just enhanced what we do in the room and given us a way to share what we're doing with a larger audience. So this boy created a map, he created a timeline, he wrote some facts on note cards and then he held it up in front of the Chromebook and took a picture um, and then he summarized his research about Magellan here. Um, and obviously we see some writing things we need to work on as far as run-on sentences and things like that, but that wasn't what I was assessing in this. I wanted to see how he could, um, in his own words, transfer his knowledge. I should back up and say that I use both the, the Lucy Calkins writing workshop and reading workshop. I use her units of study. Uh, we have the curriculum materials for both of those. And while she doesn't have a lot of tech specifically integrated into those units. Um, my twist is to use technology to publish our work or to share our work. And I found the workshop model to lend itself very nicely um, to both blogging and to using technology tools. For instance, when we finish publishing a piece, the, the final step is to take um, either photos of the writing or to transfer the writing to a screencasting app or to the blog and then audio record the kids reading their writing so that we always have that uh, record of their progress. So I mentioned screencasting a few times as um, the tool, another tool that we use for recording authentic work and on the iPad, there are so many awesome choices for screencasting that it's very hard to just pick one. Um, I started with Explain Everything because I found it to be easy to use and to have all of the tools that we needed. And it gave us the option to upload videos either to YouTube um, for publishing um, in other places or it gave us the option to save to a camera roll and upload to the blog. Um, Explain Everything was always the first tool I taught K1s to use um, and it always took an extraordinary amount of patience. Um, I, I we wished I had a ticker for how many times I said touch the plus sign, <laughs> but they always got it um, to the point that usually by about November 
I could say, they can explain everything tool, and they could do that with very little help. In a combo classroom, it's advantageous to have older kids and younger kids, because in the, K, in the K1, the first graders were always my tech helpers, and I could pair them with a kindergartner, and they could usually help their classmates figure out the tools or do the get to them when I couldn't. We found Book Creator last year and Shadow Puppet, um, both uh, you know, slightly different and just had different features that the kids really liked. Uh, they loved Shadow Puppet because it gave them the option to add background music to their work, and it was much uh, faster as far as quickly uploading pictures of their writing and giving them the opportunity to talk over their writing and then have some background music. Book Creator became my favorite because it was so K1 friendly um, and had, had the draw tool and had the audio recording. And then we could upload it to not just uh, the camera roll or to the blog, but we could also put it in iBooks. And now suddenly um, the iPad had digital books that the kids have written, which was very powerful. But then I moved to fourth and fifth, and those iPad tools uh, were available if we borrowed the iPads, but I needed to find something that worked for the Chromebooks. And so that's where Screencastify has come in for us. And it's a very easy tool that um, is pinned onto our Chrome browser, and it took um, on maybe less than 10 minutes for the fourth and fifth graders to pick up that they could just hit that, and they could have their Google Doc on the screen and they could record themselves reading their Google Doc, and then it would instantly save it to our uh, Google Drive, which was cool, because then I could share them with each, I could put them in a folder, share that folder with the whole class so they could view it within our community. Um, and I could also share that folder with their parents. Um, and then I could upload them to YouTube, and so we'd have the recordings on YouTube. From there, a cool thing I like to do is once it becomes a YouTube video, I've got a link that I can convert to a QR code. And then I can tape that QR code to the writing itself and send the writing home. Um, I used to teach parents how to scan QR codes in parent-teacher conferences. And so that they would always have that book and the student reading their writing with them whenever they needed it. When I use YouTube, I always make the video unlisted so that anyone with a link can get to it, but it wouldn't be something that someone could search for. So that's a, a great way to use screencasting. And like I said, we use it mostly for publishing writing, but it's also a great tool for just sharing their learning in any subject. Now, this is a tool we've added to our room because we did so much audio recording. Nothing will break a child's heart like putting all this work into a screencast only to listen to the playback and have all the classroom background noise show up and none of their voice show up. Um, like I said earlier, my class is loud and it's always loud. And, when, and it usually would work that if a kid recorded their, themselves writing, what we heard in the background was the kids talking and then me not sounding pleasant. It never worked. I, my voice was coming across as pleasant when they came up in the recording. Um, so we needed a solution. And so I had a good friend, I have a good friend who at the time was teaching uh, high school physics in Deer Lodge, Montana. Her name is Jessie Anderson. And we were talking about this, this problem I was having. And she said, I'm going to have one of my physics students build your class a sound booth. And that'll be her physics project that she's going to work on throughout the year. And so this lovely girl named Emma Watson um, spent her, her year in physics figuring out um, how to construct a sound booth for elementary school students. And we sent her measurements of our corner of the room. And we had a kid sit on a chair and measure how far from the top of his head to his feet he would, it would need to be for height. And then we also gave some specifications. You know, we need a place to put the iPad so that we're not touching it, because we also have learned that if you hold the iPad and your hand is over the microphone, that will affect your recording. So what came back about, you know, a year later um, was this sound booth, which when you walk into the room, people always assume it's some little, you know, prison cell that I've got set up for kids. Um, but she's got basically eggshell mattresses on the outside of plywood, and we just pull the door open, and we've got a chair in there, and she 
place a little ledge to put the iPad on. And so the way it works is it catches the student's voice beautifully. You can still hear some background noise um, in the room. And of course, my voice carries and ends up over there. I'm always saying something like, OK, everybody, let's get ready to go, you know. But um, it does get their little voices and much more clear. And it's, it's really improved the quality of our recordings. I did move it across the call for the fourth and fifth graders. Um, and they use it to make their screencasts, but they've also found it to be a great place to go and listen to themselves read their writing out loud while they're editing. And it gives them a quiet place to hear how their writing sounds and allows them to add periods where they need to be. And um, it's, it's become kind of a, we've kind of forged a quiet space in the room. And we kind of set it up and then we can fold it up and lean it against the wall when we're not using it. The next thing I want to talk about is concept mapping. And in the K-1, it's a very important way. It became a, a really important tool for having the kids share their learning in a visual way. And for four or five, it has the same effect, but they can go a little bit deeper with it because they can add text as well as pictures. I use two tools for concept mapping. One is BrainPop's Make a Map tool, which you can see in the photo here. Um, and that is just part of all of their topics have the Make a Map tool associated with them. And so kids can pull images as well as screenshots from the BrainPop video into a concept map and then use different arrows to connect their ideas and then add text to label those ideas. Um, the other one we use is Poplet. And there, it manages to both tools. But I'll say that what I do then is the kids create these tools, they take screenshots of them, they upload them to the blog. So all of this, everything we create ends up on the blog. So we always have a, a space for these, for these pieces of evidence. This is an example of a make a map tool, a concept map using BrainPop's concept map. This, uh, this is, both of these are kindergarten examples. So these kids used mostly pictures to show what was meant to be a, a cycle process. So in the top one, we've got, I wanted them to show the water cycle and how it related to snowflakes after watching a snowflake video. And this was after we had gone out to the playground and gotten a cup of snow and brought it in and extracted the snowflakes with toothpicks and then looked at them closely with hand lenses. Um, then they had them watch the video on Brain Pop about snowflakes and go through some of those activities and then create this make a map to show that. And so as an assessment piece, I feel like the student has a pretty good understanding and was able to show me what she understands about the, uh, the, the water cycle and how it relates to snowflakes. Now, they did have vocabulary words written on a whiteboard to copy that typing from the whiteboard into the uh, make a map. I should say that. In the bottom, it was the natural resources was the topic. This one was a little bit more open-ended. It was, you know, watch the video about natural resources, um, go to the make a map tool and create a make a map that tells us what your understanding is of natural resources. What I love about the fact that they can drag screenshots in and images from the video is they end up watching that video three or four times in the co process of making this map which we know that repetition is the best teacher for all kids, but especially primary kids. And then, of course, these screenshots were uploaded to EasyBlog, and then using the audio record tool in EasyBlog, the kids were able to record themselves sharing their, their thinking behind these maps and explaining the relationships and the images, which was very powerful because when you look at this, you might not know exactly what their thought process is. But if you give them the chance to audio record themselves talking about it, um, they really enjoy that. And Book Creator and uh, Explain Everything will go a little bit further in that they could put these in those tools and then they can use an annotation tool to annotate over top of the map and explore their thinking further. So those are, it's a powerful assessment tool. This is a poplet example. And what we love about Poplet on the iPads is the drawing tool. And so the kids could type in the words, as you see here. And again, 
the K-1 kids had these words available to them to copy from the board. Um, I am a great teacher, but I have, I have failed at teaching K-1 to, te to spell the words condensation, evaporation, and precipitation without help. So I don't want that to, any misconceptions about, about that. Um, but they, they were able to share the cycl cyclical process of this and give uh, an image for each of those vocabulary words. And again, this, this just gets saved to the camera roll and uploaded to EasyBlog so we can see it later or put into a screencast where they can um, talk about this process a little bit further. The other way we use technology in my classroom is for reading. And these are three of the tools that we use at the primary level, um, Epic, Unite, and BookFlix. Epic is free, Unite is free, BookFlix does require a subscription based on the size of your school. Um, in K-1, I would have digital reading day every Friday. And so the kids would not use their book boxes to read during reading workshop. They would grab their iPads and they would use um, one of these three tools that was in a, a folder called a reading on the iPad. And then as a teacher, I could kind of walk around and sit down and conference with them about what they were reading on the iPad. Um, I don't think digital reading should replace real books. But I think sometimes it, it, it engages the reader in a different way. And what was great about all of these tools was they were using them at home. And parents were super excited to have them using their screen time to practice reading. Uh, my fourth and fifth graders like Epic. Um, however, they're not always able to find things that are at their higher reading level. They enjoy it for, you know, the picture books and looking up some nonfiction things here and there. And there is there are some videos and things embedded into Epic that they like. Um, but they are actually more interested in reading uh, New Zealand, um, which is the nonfiction website with uh, current events and newspaper articles. And so that's when we do digital reading day in my class. Most of the time, they they gravitate toward New Zealand. We are big co coders at Lamont School. Um, I started coding with my kids about three or four years ago. Um, hour of Code uh, has, has already begun at my school. We, so we did some of the unplugged Hour of Code activities just yesterday. Um, with K1, we started with Codable. And it is a subscription. You can get some of it for free. And then to have access to the whole site, you do need a school subscription. I found them great to work with and really, um, really open to feedback and suggestions. It's a very, it's a game-based coding program um, where the kids do all of their work dragging arrows into, a, into some boxes to create a sequence for these little fuzzes to roll through the mazes. Um, we also just got the Osmo coding set. It's super popular with my fourth and fifth graders. We use Osmo coding once a week on Fridays for game stations um, during our math block. Um, I had to beg for a third set because we had only had two. And I had to beg for a third set because the kids were so excited about it, but they really liked doing it on their own. The sharing it was, was not as much fun. So we have three Osmo sets at Lamont. Um, and Osmo Coding is one of their favorites. BrainPop also has an excellent collection of coding games, videos, and lesson plans on their website. And I found their computer science and Ada Lovelace videos to be really helpful in teaching kids about coding. It's important to me that kids know that coding isn't just playing games, that it's actually the act of programming a computer to do what you need it to do. And so um, we do lessons about that. I found Tinker on the PBS Learning Media site. PBS Learning Media also has an excellent selection of coding videos and games for free that I would encourage you to check out as well. All right, we talked about mystery meetings, uh, mystery Skype, mystery Hangouts. I like both. Um, usually I go with whatever platform the person we're communicating with wants to use. Um, I started mystery meetings with a teacher in South Carolina who invited me to do it. And in that one, we used the, the location challenge, which was we had a map, and they had a map, and they didn't know where we were, and we didn't know where they were. And we asked each other questions, back, yes and no questions, back and forth to try and figure out where they were. The first question is, are you east of the Mississippi? 
um, or are you west of the Mississippi, whichever one. And then that just kind of draws a line down the United States and then we, we ask back and forth until we can figure it out. With K-1, that was an end of the year activity and the geography preparation was labor intensive. Um, and the first graders really took the the, for the leadership role in that one. I'm not sure how close, how much the kindergartners got out of it. Um, but they still remember it to this day and loved it. I modified it for the K-1 the next year and we played mystery number with a class. And that was where we'd connect with another class and we'd each take, we'd each choose a number and we'd have number grids in front of us and the kids would take turns asking each other questions, trying to guess the other class's number. Um, that was much easier with K-1s and excellent for teaching about number sense and where we were on the number grid and a lot of fun for the kids to see into other classrooms from across the country. Um, what the kids are doing in this picture though is we got to participate in a tour of the Brain Pop office last spring. And so that is um, Andrew Gardner on the screen talking to us live from the New York City office of Brain Pop and they brought a bunch of different classes together that day to um, go on a virtual tour of their offices. And it was really cool for my kids to have them show the camera and looking right out the window of their office, right at the, new, at the uh, Empire State Building. Um, Moby himself appeared in the video, which was a, a high point <laughs> for the kids. Um, and it's been a great way. You saw where we are. We're surrounded by horse pasture and meadows and mountains, but not a lot of people. Um, and so, and our field trip opportunities, we don't have a bus, you know, we have to get parent drivers to take us places, so technology takes us all over the world. Um, and so in this, in this particular day, we got to go to New York City. Um, my class and I will be, my school and I will be doing a mystery Skype-a-thon on December 19th, Monday, December 19th. I talked my coworkers into this. And each of our classes will be uh, mystery Skyping that day with a classroom. We're currently looking for classrooms to connect with. And so if you would like to Skype with one of our classes, please email me. Um, we're going to need a, someone for K-1, someone for 2-3, someone for 4th and 5th, and then someone for 6th and 7th, and then someone else for the 8th graders. So if you have a group that meets somewhere in that at range and you'd like to um, connect, we'd love that. I think we'll do mystery number with the K-1 groups and then we'll do mystery location with the older kids and we'll do a lot of prep with the kids um, leading up to that. But my hope is that we can um, throughout that day connect with classrooms possibly all over the world and that'll be uh, December 19th and that is a Monday. And so you can get a hold of me if you think that you might uh, want to help us and participate in that. Um, Genius Hour is something that I did with K-1. No, I should say I did it with first graders. Um, it was tricky with kinders. Um, but I did it with first graders for a couple of years. And I had them choose a topic they were passionate about learning about. And I asked them to get lost in their research. And we used the tools um, PBS and BrainPop and KidRex is a fairly safe search tool. And most of them studied animals, um, bears and bats and dinosaurs and things like that. And we would spend about, it was more like a genius half hour uh, once a week where they just watched videos and read, um, you know, quick little pieces of text on different places and learned as much as they could about their topic. It was really powerful um, it, as a self-paced activity, especially for my higher level kids. Um, I did try to add kindergartners last spring and it, it just, didn't go well. The kinders just were not quite ready for independent research. And so there are lots of ways that you could scaffold that for kinders. Um, and what I learned is that they just, they needed a little bit more support um, in doing this type of research. Um, I haven't carried it into fourth and fifth. What we're doing in fourth and fifth is we're doing more makerspace things in fourth and fifth. And we are using these tools instead for research in all, all kinds of other places. Um, we also do a lot of self-placed blended activities and these are some of my favorite tools for blended learning. Um, these kids are, are going through a self-placed blended science unit I created last year using iTunes University. Um, we have the app on the iPad. I haven't been able to make it public yet. I've got to work on, on that so you can see what the kids were doing. 
um, but I basically compiled different levels about, um, we did a liquids and solids and gas unit, states of matter unit, and then we did a unit on pollinators. Um, and the kids went through basic different levels where they watched videos and read things and then created blog posts about what they learned. Um, and then we had it gamified so they got badges for each level that they finished. And it was something I started doing last year with the K-1s and it was a really cool way to let the kids work at their own pace. It allowed me to work with some of the kids that needed more help and let the kids that were faster just move through the content. Um, I used primarily BrainPop and PBS uh, videos for their content. Um, and then Happy Numbers is separate from those things. Happy Numbers is a great K-2 math program um, for kids to do at a math center and do some self-paced work going through Common Core math activities. It's very visual, it's very touch screen friendly, um, and it is a subscription program and so there probably are some other free things out there, but this one is free of ads and easy to use and also gave me a tracking tool as a teacher so I could go in and see their, their progress. Um, this is my last slide. I know I'm a little bit over time. I knew I told you, Peggy, that I, I never can do things on time. <laughs> um, but these are a few of my other favorite things. Uh, I mentioned Promethean earlier um, as, as a great tool. I mentioned Alpha, my choice, my um, involvement with the Alpha Schools program, Reflector, is a, such a cool tool for mirroring what we have on the iPad to the computer, which then projects onto the Promethean. You can have a bunch of different screens get up there at once. Um, we can also mirror our Chromebooks to the iPad so that, you know, we're over here and Sam has created a really cool make a map that I want everyone to see it. Sam connect real quick using Reflector and now everybody can see what Sam has done and we can have a really engaging, authentic discussion in the moment using that tool. I love Participate Learning as a place to curate my resources. Um, my unit planning begins with going to participate in compiling a collection in that area um, and then using that as a place to, to create any kind of unit that I'm doing. Um, I believe the link we put in the live binder will take you to my personal Participate Learning page so you can see all of the collections I've created there. Um, Participate's also cool because they've got a, a chat tool as well. You can participate in Twitter chats through their website and then you can directly take the resources and tools shared in a Twitter chat and add those to a collection organized on Participate Learning. It's a beautiful streamlined way to participate in a Twitter chat. Um, so those new to Twitter chat uh, like it because it's not as busy and it's an, a much more organized way to go about a Twitter chat experience. Um, and then this, this uh, DF distraction free YouTube is um, my go-to for changing YouTube so that when I show videos on my big screen they don't see the ad comments and they don't, they don't see the ad space, they don't see the junk that YouTube has. And this is a Chrome extension that I just have and it just kind of cleans up YouTube and makes it a little bit more teacher friendly. And we're, we, we don't have it loaded on the kids devices yet. Like I said, we're new to the one-to-one -one Chromebook, so we're still getting Chrome extensions pushed out to all the kids. But the goal is to get that there too, just to clean up YouTube a little bit. And whew, that is everything um, I have for you. And I would love to hear your questions. I've seen a lot of them show up in the chat here. And so I'm going to turn it back over to our moderators and um, I can answer questions for as long as you'll let me. Wow, Nikki, that was <clears throat> absolutely fantastic and awesome. I've been bookmarking things and uh, opening things and I've got a lot like tab overload going on. But I did manage, this is Paula, I did manage to collect a few questions that we'd like to um, have you answer. This one came from me. I am slowly moving to flexible seating in my classroom. And since you have lots of choices, I was wondering, um, what is it that your students gravitate toward the most? Which kind of flexible seating? I have to say they love the yoga balls. Um, and I have about six of them now. Um, a few of them were donated from a local gym. And then the others, I think the school had purchased. And then we just had a, a family of a student come in and donate another one yesterday. Um, the uh, ability to bounce 
and to be in motion is really attractive to my kids. And kids that are always in motion anyway, I found can when they're given just the permission to be bouncy, they're a lot more productive and a lot less distracted. So I'd say the yoga balls are really popular um, and the couch is very popular. We have a rotation system for the chairs. I use clothespins and a chart with the pictures on it and I rotate um, their clothespins around so that um, everybody gets a turn on all of the different stuff because um, when we first started the year I didn't do that and they were kind of running each other down to get to certain yoga balls or piling too many people on the couch. So we just had to organize it a little bit. Um, and I changed that clip chart twice a day so that students have a chance to have the different stuff. They love all of the, all of the seating choices, um, but I would say the yoga balls are probably the favorite. Well, thank you for sharing that. Love the management idea of the, the clip chart. Um, another question I have is, can EasyBlog be opened up for a global audience? Um, are you able to lock it down or open it up as much as possible by um, you know, sharing out a URL link? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. EasyBlog has settings so that you can make it as private or as public as you want it to be. Um, the iPad app um, I w is the one that you can get to my K1, and so that's a little bit different than the one that I'm using with 4.5. We are beta testing their school-wide version right now, and so we've had a little trouble getting the settings right so that a global audience can see our posts, and we're currently working on that. So we've just been we just tried to be patient with them about that. So that's probably why some of you couldn't log in and see the posts without a password. Um, but using the app through the iPad um, is, that has been a much easier way to streamline and get the settings so that uh, my blogging philosophy is that I want everybody to see, our, to see our stuff. We have a rule that we just don't post pictures of kids' faces and we don't post last names so that we have some kind of safety there. Um, and then I we just blog away and we want anybody and everybody to see it. Other schools and districts have different policies and different comfort levels and parents have different comfort levels. I live in a small environment where a lot of the things that um, happen in the bigger districts just don't exist. So it's been easier probably for us than in bigger schools. EasyBlog has a lot of settings so that you can lock it down and make it as private so that only the parent sees it or just the school community sees it. I believe the way our fourth, my fourth and fifth grade one is set up is only people within our school committee can see, community can see those posts right now. Um, and we are working on changing it so that that opens it up. And I also say that parents can subscribe to their students' blog so that every time the student posts something, the parent will get an email immediately after with a link to that post. And parents have really enjoyed that because they can, in real time almost, gauge their kid's progress. They can sit at work, listen to their kid audio, record, audio recording a, a blog post, and then they have talking points as soon as they pick up that kid from school to tell them about what they saw. That's a great idea. Okay, this question came from Wes Fryer. He wants to know, how do you help other teachers overcome fears of being judged by parents for student spelling errors on public blogs? Yeah, I've had a lot of teachers um, ask me, you know, do I, do I edit their work before it goes to publish? Um, and I always just say, no, I don't. You know, this is a, an authentic picture of where they are in their learning at this moment in time. And we cannot teach students to be risk takers and we cannot teach grit and stamina and perseverance if we don't let them publish those mistakes. And it's a very progressive and new way of thinking. Um, I always tell teachers that you can put as many um, checks into place in your classroom before a student publishes as you need. You know, you can insist that nothing gets published until you have looked at it and conferenced with the student and given them every opportunity to fix it. Um, or you can just let them post away and let parents and teachers know that this is an authentic picture of where they are at this moment in time. And there is no better way to monitor growth than to have 
a post with a whole bunch of spelling errors and sentence fragments and run-on sentences in November and compare that to a much nicer post in May that probably has a lot of those things worked out. Excellent points. Thank you, Nikki. Wes also wanted to um, <clears throat> ask you this question about your YouTube setting. He said that you make your default privacy setting uh, for YouTube videos unlisted. He wanted to know why not make them public. Do you know about a teacher who has had a bad experience sharing student work on a public YouTube channel? I don't. Um, but I did get, I, most of the parents in my classroom have been really excited about what we're doing until YouTube came into play. And I had a few parents that were very nervous um, because of YouTube having sort of the reputation that it does and didn't really like the idea of their kids' voice or work uh, being um, publicly available on the YouTube. And so for their comfort and because I wanted to keep their buy-in in what I was doing, I made it unlisted and made it so only those with a link could see their, their work. Um, and that was just to, to keep them with me. Um, I think at this point I could certainly make a case for making those things public, but I would, I would feel like I would need to get permission and have a really detailed permission form where the parents would say, yes, my student's work, my student's voice, my student's picture, you know, and checking all those boxes to before it would go on YouTube. And I really just haven't wanted to go about <laughs> and do all that work. Um, so my, my answer has just been to assure them that it, their work wasn't searchable. I don't have a bad story about it happening to teachers or having it blow back. Um, again, I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> but I teach in a really small environment where so far all of our experiences have been really, really positive. Thank you for that. All right. Um, is there a link um, somewhere um, in, I hope we have it in the live binder, about the sound booth idea to give us more information? I don't have any links about that. Um, I, can, I can give you, at least the, you know, the Twitter information for the teacher that I collaborated with, Jessica Anderson, um, and then her student, Emma Watson, was the student who did it, but that wasn't, you know, we really haven't published anything about that or created um, any other information other than, you know, putting some pictures out there. So that's certainly something that Jesse and I probably need to get together and um, come up with some kind of a quick little video to share about that experience. I did get to read Emma's paper on it, and part of her project was the paper she had to write up about her project she shared with me so I could see all the work that she had put into um, building the sound booth and all the different materials she had tested and tried. So that's something Jesse and I could definitely work on in the months to come. All right, and I think this might be the last question that I've collected. Uh, Maureen, I'm not sure if she was asking specifically of you or just anyone in the room. She wondered if you were using the Recap app for student reflection. I've never heard of that one. I'm, uh, that's cool. I will check it out. I don't know about that one. Thank you. I know that I started using the Recap app uh, since I learned about it from from Maureen, and I think you'll like it. Okay, yay, we have a participant who has raised her hand, and um, Carrie is going to ask a question. Carrie is the talk button under your picture, under where you are. Just push it and ask your question. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, good. So thank you so much for sharing all these resources. I think all of us have some homework to do after watching this. And you're very inspiring and just awesome to see the passion and inspiration. Um, my question is about two different 
things that I heard. One was, um, let me see where it is, how you project your screens on that second to last slide, I think it was. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Reflector? Yes. Okay, and so that that's how you can go back and forth between what the individual students are doing, project it, say, hey, so-and-so over here is doing this, pop it up for us? Yes. And and reflector is there a, is there a cost with that? I guess is my question. Yeah. So reflector is um, basically software you would need to download to your computer, um, and you can get a download for I, I believe between twelve and fifteen dollars um, a license for your computer, and then it's a one time purchase. Um, they're really great about giving you a trial first. Um, they give it away a lot. Um, they let me give it away a lot, <laughs> um, and it, it, it's just the mirroring software. So once it's downloaded onto your computer, then you can swipe up from the bottom on an iPad and use AirPlay to find it, or on a Chromebook, you would go into the little, um, it's on the bottom right-hand corner where you log in, and it will say, um, show AirCast devices. And it should, if it's in range of your computer and they're on the same Wi-Fi, you can they, you can connect to mirror with the computer that has it on the on your screen, and then you can mirror their work on your screen. And if you're plugged into a projector, it'll show up on the the big screen. It, it, it's it's not a perfect tool, you know. Sometimes it doesn't the Wi-Fi doesn't let it connect or do what it needs to do. And we're currently working on our Wi-Fi connections at school so that it's a bit more reliable and easier to use. It works beautifully with iPads, um, and I'm still working out the glitches for Chromebooks. And I think it's mostly our our Wi-Fi, not the tool itself. Cool. I, I like that it's iPad and Chromebook friendly at the same time. So right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then my other question was, you mentioned that your one tool that you couldn't live without is your Promethean. I was just wondering if you could give a couple of reasons to support that. Yeah, so I think, you know, Promethean is just what we have. I think probably the, the bigger love for me is just the interactive whiteboard. So whether it's a Promethean or a smart board or if it's an IPVO solution, I think they're all great and they all do basically the same thing. But what I love is that I can project an image and then I can annotate over that image with my pen. Um, I like the Active Inspire software that comes with Promethean. Um, I think it's really easy to use and um, a great way to create flip charts with uh, video and pictures, and then I can annotate over those things. I used it a lot with the K1. That was how we did our calendar and how we tracked the weather, and the kids would come up and draw directly on a, a graph on the board to track our weather. Um, I could probably get along with just a projector connected to my computer um, if I had to, but I really like the interactive feature of the annotation tool as well. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for your questions. I appreciate it. Wow, what a, what a great presentation. We are so glad that we um, had Nikki with us today. Thank you again so much. And for oh, all of you for you. sharing your enthusiasm and expertise um, with Classroom 2.0 Live. Thank you for your support. We would also like to thank our sponsors, Blackboard Collaborate, Learning Revolution, and Steve Hargadon. Um, as we do our wrap-up for the show, um, let me see what it's like. Okay, here is a list of our upcoming shows. Whoops, wait a minute. It always skips me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Peggy, do you want to take over here? I sure do. Thank you so much, Nikki. What an inspiring hour that just flew by. And thank you, Paula. You are an awesome hostess. 
Um, just in case you don't know, we have a show almost every Saturday. And next week, we're going to be featuring Seesaw for the entire presentation. And Peg Bullock, who is a Seesaw ambassador, is going to be with us. So you'll want to come and learn all about that. December 17th, we have another amazing educator. Valerie Lewis is going to be our featured teacher. And she has done all kinds of things with technology. And some of you may know her from Past the Scope EDU or Voxer. She's very active on both of those. And she'll be sharing all of those kinds of great ways to connect for educators. And then we'll take two weeks off for our winter break. And we'll be back on January 7th to celebrate the entire year of 2016 have a little party online, and that will be our eighth anniversary. We will have actually completed eight years as a regular show on Classroom 20 Live. So we hope you'll come back every Saturday you can to join us. And be sure to take a look at the additional tabs in our live binder. Steve Hargadon is such an incredible mentor. And he has the Learning Revolution site that tells you all about upcoming conferences and webinars. Our calendar is right there on that site. And they're all free. So be sure to check that out. We hope you'll. Nominate a featured teacher. If you know someone like Nikki and like Peg Bullock coming up who you think would be great presenters for us, fill in that form and tell us about them so we can contact them. And be sure to uh, fill in the survey if you'd like to have a PD certificate. It should pop up when you log out. And if it doesn't, it's always in our live binder. So. Thank you again to Nikki and to all of you for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend.